Hey YouTube brothers and sisters, how are you doing? I got another word today that I wanted to share with you that was dealing with law and grace and we discussed it my last video. I said I was going to pick up on it, but I would like first of all for you to like, subscribe, and share this word of God with another brother or sister so we can increase the kingdom of God. Make sure also you hit that little notification bell so that you can get all the new videos that are coming out. I'm going to jump right into this word. Remember on my last video, I told you that I was a teacher of the word of God. So it takes time to teach. If you're looking for a quick three to five, seven minute video, you won't find that here. We go in depth with the word of God, the study of word with the word of God. I want to thank all of my subscribers, my new subscribers that are subscribing to the channel. I thank you very much. I humbly appreciate it. I wanted to also say to some of my brothers and sisters out there that I fellowship with, the, uh, my bishop, the Honorable Bishop Norman L. Wagner, who transitioned about 11, 10, 11 years ago, I believe about 11 years ago right now, he taught that revelation is progressive. And, you know, I, I hear some of you say, well, my bishop never taught that. My bishop never taught that the Hebrew Israelites were a black race of people. My bishop never said this and that. Uh, the Bible says in the last days that knowledge shall increase and people shall run to and fro. So 11 years ago, God took our pastors and bishops to whatever level they could bring us to. They brought us to the fullness of fruition in the spirit that they could bring us to. So now that they have transitioned 11 years ago, some longer than that, progressive and uh, revelation being progressive is still coming. Knowledge is still increasing. So you're going to find out new things about God that you never knew before. So don't become discouraged. Don't become afraid and say, well, I never heard this before because you're stagnant. And that means you're caught up and you're stuck in religion. I'm one that's not caught up in religion. I'm not caught up in apostolic, Pentecostal, uh, Church of God in Christ, doctrine, Baptist, whatever it is. I'm not caught up in doctrine. I'm caught up in God. So you want to continue to be caught up in progressive revelation, knowledge of the word of God and not become stagnant where you're a bishop or your pastor transitioned or expired 10, 12, 20 years ago and stay with that knowledge and never increase and grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. God is always putting out new revelation, new knowledge, even if the Lord should tarry another 20, 30 years from now, there is going to be more knowledge and increase of the word of God that is going to come forth new things in the Bible because knowledge shall increase in the last days. Okay, brothers and sisters, we're going to get right into this word. This is going to be a little bit lengthy. I might have to do a part two of this. But like I said, we dive deep into the word of God. We don't deal with surface issues. And I understand that this topic I am about to discuss, this is a big debatable topic uh, and discussion with the Hebrew Israelites. This is something that a lot of it is being taught unbalanced and not correctly because people don't know how to separate law from grace you know back in those bible days that's the problem you had you had the israelites trying to mix law with grace so you got into a big discussion a big argument so i'm going to let you know my stand where do i stand with the law because yes even though i claim to be a hebrew israelite and the black race of people and those other races around the world that have been scattered abroad the nation brought over here by slave ships uh you've got to know your stance and your position with the law and i know a lot of you brothers and sisters you deal with not eating lobster shrimp uh the sabbath day uh go and i understand the catholic church changed the sabbath day from saturday to sunday and everything else like that so we understand the sabbath day is on saturday it's the seventh day it's not the first day of the week sunday that was changed by your catholic church but we're going to put in perspective law and grace from a biblical perspective and hopefully i can open up some eyes of you that are followers of the law and speak some spiritual things into your ear that might wake you up. All right, this is law versus grace. I'm going to just talk a little bit about my last video where I uh, and bring you up to date. 
We talked about Father Abraham. God told Father Abraham to get thee out into this country that I shall show you. And I'm going to make you a great and a mighty nation. And your seed shall be as the stars of heaven. You will have so many seeds, so many children, that they will outnumber the stars of heaven. It will be like the sands on the sea shore. So God tells Abraham to get thee out, and I'm going to bless you with a nation of people. Now, I spoke in that last video, and I said, in order for you to have a nation, you have to have three things. Those three things are people, land, and law. You need a people, and you need a land, and you need a law. The people that God gave to Abraham was the Hebrew Israelites. The Hebrew Israelites were the people God gave to Abraham. Now, Abraham himself was an Israelite. Jesus Christ, the Messiah himself, he was an Israelite from the tribe of Judah. Okay, God gave them number two, land. As a nation, if you're going to be a nation, you've got to have the people and you've got to have the land. The land God gave unto the Israelites was Canaan, which is today Israel. God gave them the land of Canaan that they subdued back then, and that land flowed with milk and honey, and every good thing was in that land. Everything they needed was there in that land. Number three, God gave them the law, and this is where we're going to pick up the video today on the law. The law is the Torah, or the Pentateuch. It is the first five books of the Bible. It is Genesis, it is Exodus, it is Leviticus, it is Numbers, and it is Deuteronomy. I explained in my last video those first five books of the Bible, the Torah, which the Hebrew Israelites hold to, which those fake Jews over in Israel right now claiming to be Jews, they converted and they switched over to Judaism which they were never a part of Judaism before, but they converted and proselyted over because they did not want to become part of the Christian faith with, the, with a miracle, or they did not want to become Muslims, so they chose in between to proselyte over to Judaism. Now here, in this Judaism, they uphold the law. Like I said, the first five books, you have Genesis, which is the book of beginnings. You have Exodus, which is them leaving slavery, leaving Egypt, getting out of there, their deliverance. You have Leviticus. This is where God starts giving laws to Moses to give to the people, the Hebrew Israelites, teaching them how to live. Now, I want to point out specifically, God chose one nation to speak to. That nation was Israel. There were all kinds of nations around at that time. God could have spoken, used anybody else, but he only chose one nation that was the nation of Israel that he chose to use to decree his laws, his commandments, his statutes, his precepts, so that they can make the, the world, they can make God known to the world through them. So God only dealt with them, his laws, his commandments, he only dealt with Israel, no other nation did he even deal with. So in Leviticus, God gives Moses the laws concerning all kind of laws. They had over 613 laws in the Bible. And we're going to hit that here in a second. So that's what we get Leviticus. In the book of Numbers of the Torah, God starts numbering. The reason why it's called Numbers, the book of Numbers, God starts putting together his tribes, tribe of Dan, tribe of Judah. Uh, so all the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, are coming together and God is putting leaders in heads and he's calling a census together, a numbering together of the people. That's why it's called the book of numbers. That's your fourth book. Your fifth book is the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy means the repeating of the law. The Israelites were hard-headed, which we are a stiff-necked, a rebellious group of people. That is why we went into slavery, because we did not honor the Lord our God. We did not acknowledge him. We served other idol gods. And God said, because of this, you will go into captivity. So we went into captivity. So every time the Israelites sin, don't worship another God. God gave another law to Moses, all kind of laws. Now, this is where we're getting into our teaching today. So you might want to go grab your Bible because we're going to be studying from Romans chapter 7, 
verses 1 through 25 is what I'm going to break down exegetical study and go into about the law versus grace. And we're going to see what does the Bible say about this. So for you Hebrew Israelites, and I am a Hebrew Israelite, but I serve God by grace. But that does not mean that the law is bad or that the law is done away with. And I'll explain that more. This is what I'm trying to say. For you Hebrew Israelites that's trying to talk about you shouldn't eat lobster, you shouldn't eat seafood, the Sabbath day, you all going to church on Sunday, all this kind of stuff, you're wrong and you're going to hell for this and that. I just taught on religion. You've got to get out of the spirit of religion. What's controlling you is man-made concepts, ideologies, philosophies. You don't want man-made ideal. You want the word of God, not the commandments and the traditions of men. So there are 613 laws that God gave his Israelite people, 613 laws. And if you Israelites today think you are keeping all of those laws, you are fooling and deceiving yourselves. That's the reason why Jesus Christ had to come. Jesus had to come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law because man could not uphold the law. Man wanted to do good. He wanted to abide by the law on the outside, but see what God did in the New Testament. He gave us a new heart and a new spirit. So therefore we could walk in the spirit and those laws would be written on the tablets or the tables of our heart. We wouldn't walk around with phylacteries, with signs and what would Jesus do and all kind of necklaces and rosaries and crosses and counting beads and doing this and that to uphold the laws. The laws now are in our heart. That's where the laws are now. Okay, so you had 613 laws God gave the Israelites. Somebody will say, well, what kind of laws are those that God gave the Israelites? Those laws were moral laws. Moral laws dealing with adultery, dealing with incest. You can't sleep with your brother's wife. You can't sleep with your brother. You can't sleep with your sister. These were low, uh, uh, laws God had to give moral laws to teach his people. You can't sleep with a beast. You can't sleep with an animal. So God gave them moral laws. God gave them dietary laws. He told them how to eat. You can't eat uh, uh, different kind of animals. Eat the animals that, uh, uh, they, the scales, I believe he said with the scales on them, uh, everything else like that. Those kind of animals were clean. You know, so he got into dietary laws of don't eat lobsters and don't eat shrimp and shellfish and all this kind of stuff that eat off of the ground. And there's a reason why God gave these laws on dietary. Don't eat swine. Don't eat pig. And in no ways am I fighting this, saying that you can just eat all the swine, the pig, or whatever you want with no repercussions. There's a reason why God gave these laws. And you all know today, all that bacon you eat, all that chitlin, chitlins you eat, all that kind of stuff, it affects your body today. It can affect your health, your blood pressure. Uh, you can get gout, all of this. So there's a reason behind all of that. So God gave them dietary laws. God also gave them civil laws. What to do when there was murder in the camp. Somebody killed somebody else. There was theft. You stole this. You did that. You got to take this brother to court, this sister to court. So God gave them civil laws. What to do in a civil matter. God gave them ceremonial laws. Laws for daily sacrifices. Now you Hebrew Israelites, you're all about this law thing. You're all about, oh, you're, you got to uphold the law and you're going to hell if you don't uphold this law and walk in the law and uphold the commandments and all of the statutes and all of the precepts. No man is perfect enough to uphold all of those 613 laws. That's why you will see when we get into the New Testament, Jesus gives us the Ten Commandments and then he gives us which is the greatest commandment, which is above all the commandments. And if you fulfill this commandment, you have fulfilled the entire law of God. So what you brothers and sisters are doing in the Hebrew Israelite uh, uh, church, you're trying to uphold laws and live by the letter. But the Bible says the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. So you're trying to do just like our Israelite brothers and sisters did in the Old Testament. And you're trying to uphold all of these laws and say, and you think you're saved by works. By grace are ye saved, and it is not of your own righteousness or your own works, but it's the gift of God. You're not saved by your works and what you did. Works precede your saved life because you're saved in a believer in Yahshua. 
those works, good works follow you. They don't precede you. You're not doing something to get into the kingdom of God. You are in the kingdom of God based on your belief of the blood of Yahshua HaMashiach. That's how you get into the kingdom, being washed in his blood and having faith in his blood. So he gave them ceremonial laws. Those laws dealt with daily sacrifices, the animals, the turtle doves, the sheep, everything that had to be killed to pay for the sins of Israel on a daily basis. All right, let's get into this word here, the study of this word. Go with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 7. We're going to read from verses 1 through 25. Know ye not, brethren, this is Paul speaking. And God gave Paul the spirit of wisdom and knowledge. I hear some people say, are you going to listen to Jesus or listen to Paul? Paul wrote most of the Bible. The spirit of God was on Paul. Paul spoke as the spirit gave him utterance and inspiration. So yes, everything Paul said is just as noteworthy and good as what Jesus said. Because he spoke through his apostles, his disciples, through the spirit of God. It's the spirit that wrote the book and inspired them what to write. Okay, Romans chapter 7, this is called, this chapter is called released from the law, released from the law. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law have dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. And we understand that he's making an analogy, a comparison here, that as long as the husband is alive, that woman is bound to that husband. If the husband is dead, she is loose from the law. She is loose from that husband. The husband is being portrayed here as the law. So if the husband died, she is free and no longer bound by the law because the law is dead. So we are no longer bound by the law because the law does not live anymore. So listen, follow me before you start judging. Follow me through. Verse 3. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law. So that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. This is the comparison. Wherefore, my brethren, verse 4. Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. How are we dead to the law? Know ye not, brothers and sisters, that all of you that have been baptized into Jesus Christ have been baptized into his death? We went down into a watery grave. You was alive to sin. But when you came up out of that water, being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are now dead to sin. You are a new creature, new things. Behold, all things have become new. So you are dead to sin. That means sin shouldn't arouse you. Sin shouldn't bother you anymore. But we still have appetites. We still have to suppress certain things. But we are dead to sin because Jesus Christ was dead to sin. And we went down in a watery grave and baptism in his death. So let's go back. Verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another. All right, let's see what we're married to. Even to him who is raised from the dead. Instead of us being married to the letter of the law that killeth, we are married to Yahshua, who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Verse 5, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death but when we were in the flesh when we get in the flesh and we act out in the flesh we sin verse 6 but now we are delivered from the law you see that we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter we serve God in the spirit of God not with the letter now with those 613 laws that we cannot keep as a people. So we serve God in the newness of, of life, of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Okay, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? No, the law is not sin. Paul even taught that. The law was our schoolmaster. 
we wouldn't have known what sin was unless the law came to teach us, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. That red light that's on the street that's hanging. When the law came and told you that that's a red light that you have to stop, now you knew it was sin. But as long as there was no law, you can just speed right through those red lights. But because there's a law, that makes you to know that is wrong. You can't do that. So was the law bad? No. All of those laws God gave, the dietary law, the ceremonial laws, the civil laws, all of those codes of conduct God gave his people, the law was great. The law was good. The problem was we as a people could not fulfill the law. See, God wanted his law fulfilled, and he saw man could not attain righteousness by upholding these 613 laws. All right? Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, no, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. See, by me letting sin reign and more and, and, and live in my body, it got in my members and it brought forth all kind of uncleanliness and all kind of lust. Okay, for without the law, sin was dead. Without the knowledge of the law, you didn't know anything. You didn't know that it was wrong to run that red light because there was no law. But when the law came, sin revived. And now there's a struggle with your spiritual man and your natural man. See, God delivered us. Uh, our spirits have been delivered, but he didn't deliver you from this body of sin. He didn't deliver you from this flesh. You are still every day fighting the battles of this flesh. All right, let's go here. Verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. You see that? For I was alive without the law once but when the commandment came sin revived and i died verse 10 and the commandment which was ordained to life god's laws was ordained to life not to death not to kill us i found to be unto death those laws put up killed us those laws we couldn't attain to even though the laws were laws of life to us, they became laws of death because we could not fulfill all of those religious laws that the Lord God had gave his people. And the Lord knew that. Verse 11, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. The sin that was in my body, verse 12, wherefore the law is holy. Yes, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and righteous and good. Verse 13, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. Is that which is good the law? The law was good. Was it made death unto me? Did God make that law to kill us? No, God forbid. God did not make those 613 laws to kill. God made those 613 laws to bring life and inspiration into his people. Was then that which is uh, good made death unto me? God forbid. Verse 13. But sin, that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Okay. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. Yes, the law is spiritual. But I am carnal. I am a natural man. I am sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not for what I for what I would, that do I. But what I hate, that do I. So here Paul is talking about a struggle. The things that I don't want to do, the sin in me causes me to do. I struggle with those things. But the good I would want to do, I can't do because I can't perform it because that good thing is not in me. But see, when I try not to do evil, evil is within me and my members and it makes me sin. So Paul says, for that which I do, I allow not. Those sins I do, it's not me, it's the sin that's living in me. For what I would, that do I not. The good I would do, I can't do because I'm not finding anything in me to help me do that good. But what I hate, that I do. The thing I don't want to do, Paul says I do. 
Verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. So the law teaches me that when I do things that are sinful, it is wrong. It is condemnation unto me. Verse 17, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. I don't know how to do that which is good. Verse 19, for the good I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. All right, you understand that. I find then that the law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. The law teaches me that when I want to do good, I do evil because the law is present with me. There's a law in my members. There's a law in my body. Verse 22, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. There's a battle. There's a struggle. When I want to do good, when I want to do right, I'm fighting myself. There's, see, when you've been born again, you're dealing with now a dual nature. You're dealing with your spiritual side and you're dealing with your fleshly side. So when you've been born again, baptized in the name of Jesus, born of the water, born of the spirit you have received the holy ghost the gift of the holy ghost with speaking in tongues as the spirit of god gives the utterance you receive the holy ghost you receive the dunamis the power of god the dynamite power of god extraordinary power this is the power you need to live right and this is what the hebrew israelites did not have in the old testament they did not have the dunamis power of god they didn't have the spirit. So that's the reason why we can live according to the Bible and we can uphold the laws of God is because we walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. So if you walk in the spirit, you will have life. But if you walk in the flesh, you will have death. So God took this thing from an outside perspective in the Old Testament and under the new covenant, the New Testament, he made it an inward thing and he wrote his laws on our hearts, on our tablets. So now we now fulfill the laws in our heart, in our mind, our body, our soul, and our spirit. So listen to this. Paul says, uh, verse 24, wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. All right. That was Romans chapter seven, verses one through 25. Okay, Paul said, I've been delivered now from this wretched body of death with all of these laws, all of these commandments, making me to know I'm sinful, I'm wrong for what I'm doing. There's deliverance now because God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, in the form of sinful flesh to condemn sin and the flesh and to bring us life. Go with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 3. One scripture I want to bring and highlight there. Romans chapter 8, verse 3, for what the law could not do. See, the law couldn't do everything for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. That meant that the Israelites didn't know how to perform it. The law was there, but the Israelites could not live up to those 613 laws. Thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal. All of those laws, they could not live and attain unto those laws. They couldn't live up to it. For what the law could not do, even though the law was good, the law was a schoolmaster. The law was a teacher. The law is holy. The law is righteous. The law is, is a good thing. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So sin has now been condemned in the flesh. Go with me. And this is, I'm coming to a close on this, but I'm going to uh, fulfill and let you know how Jesus fulfilled all of this, this law. Go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. 
I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus did not abolish the law. When Jesus spoke back then in the Old Testament and he told those people what they were supposed to do. I'm sorry, when Jesus spoke back then in the New Testament and he told those people what they were supposed to do, understand they were living under the law. One thing I try to do as a preacher and a teacher, I try not to talk on such a high level. I try to make everyone understand the scripture. Not that nobody's ignorant or dumb to the word of God, but I, everybody doesn't understand things about the Bible. Uh, you have to understand when the Bible is written, you've got to know who, when, what, why, how, who was it written to, what historic time was taking place then. You've got to know all of these questions or, or who, who is God talking to? What's the location? What's the history at that time? So when God is, Jesus is speaking in the New Testament, he is speaking under the law to these people that are under the law. So Jesus said, I came not to destroy the law. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. So that's what all of you Hebrew Israelites want to say. You guys, you preachers just want to take this law and just throw it out the window and just do away with it and say God abolished the law. He did not come to abolish the law to destroy the law. What he did was fulfill the law. Because when God came in the form of Jesus Christ to earth, he fulfilled the law. He did not break any of those 613 laws that the Israelites were given. He upheld all of those law laws, every jot, every tittle of that law. He fulfilled to perfection. So he said, think that I think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets or to tear down the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He came to fulfill the law. And this is one of our uh, almost last scriptures, the greatest commandment. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. When we get to Matthew 22, you will see this is Jesus talking here. And let's see what Jesus said about the law. Since we're on this law thing. Matthew 22 verses 35 through 40. Matthew 22 verses 35 through 40. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Out of all of these laws, 613 laws that you have given us, what is the greatest commandment out of all of these laws? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment okay verse 39 and the second is like unto it thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself verse 40 on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets so you can take all of those 613 laws wrap it up and hang it on these two laws you don't need all of those 613 laws because for one if you do what Jesus said in verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. If you do that first commandment, which he said, this is the first and the great commandment, you won't go honoring idols, worshiping idols, making graven images, taking the Lord thy God, his name in vain. If you do what Jesus said and you love the Lord God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind you have fulfilled those laws right there dealing with idolatry dealing with uh, 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 using the Lord's name in vain number two he said in the second commandment is like unto it thou shall love thy neighbor as thyself if you love your neighbor as you love yourself you won't covet your neighbor's wife ox ass you won't uh, murder you won't steal you won't kill you will you'll honor your mother, your father. See, Jesus said out of this, and the second is like commandment is like unto it. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All of these 613 laws are summed up in a total nutshell. And these two commandments, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, body, soul, and spirit, and honor your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as you would yourself. And you won't do your neighbor no ill will, no harm, and no wrong. Okay? 
And now I want one more scripture and I'm going to close this out. Go to Romans and this sums up these laws right here. And we're going I'm going to touch on something with the Sabbath days because there's more teaching into this that I have to get into. But go to Romans uh, chapter 13 verses 8 and 9. And this is going to sum up everything basically that I taught today. Romans 13 verses 8 and 9. Paul says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. You see that brothers and sisters? Owe no man anything but to love one another. Have a debt to love your neighbor, to love each other. This is how you fulfill the law. For he that loveth another have fulfilled the law. So you Hebrew Israelites, you want to talk about you guys aren't holding the Sabbath day. You guys are eating this. You're eating that swine. You ain't supposed to eat this. Do this. Do that. You fulfill the entire law according to Paul when you owe no man anything but to love one another. Because love worketh no ill towards his brother or towards his neighbor. Love speaketh no ill towards his brother, his neighbor. And it says, when you do this, for you have, for, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Okay? And I want to read verse 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet. Uh, I want to make sure I'm still recording. Okay, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So that's everything right there. When you love your neighbor as yourself, it's summed up. That's the total law right there. You are fulfilling all the laws. One more time, let me read that. Verse 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, any other commandments, those 613 commandments, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So he's taught the same thing Jesus taught, that if you love your neighbor as yourself, you have fulfilled the entire law of God. All right. My next video, I'm going to be teaching on judging your brother and Christian liberty. Why do we get into judging our brother and uh, his Christian liberty? Paul taught about the new moon, the Sabbath days. If you drink wine, if you don't drink wine, he that drink of wine, the idols and uh, idols are not anything, the meat that we eat. Uh, we're going to talk about our differences in our Christian liberty, which we have been given through Christ Jesus. All right, brothers and sisters, I thank you for your time and your patience in listening to this video. Like, subscribe, and share. Thank you to all my new subscribers. I appreciate it. And let's get more into the Word of God and study. God bless you.